Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Thank you so much for joining us for Become Famous. Uh, this episode I'm really excited about. I'm like a moon aficionado, or not as much as our guest today, but I love anything about on the moon. And this is David Merman Scott. He wrote a book with Richard Jurek called Marketing to the Moon. And David has not just written that, he's written 13 books. And uh, one that really has uh, been very important for the uh, marketing communications professional is the new marketing and PR. And I want to say welcome. Thank you. Hey, it's great to be here. Speaking of the moon, did you see the eclipse a couple of months ago? I did not get to see the eclipse. I was in Arizona, so I didn't get to see much. Did you? I actually live outside of Boston, and I brought my family up to Stowe, Vermont. And it was a really risky um, choice because... Uh, according to the various long-term weather forecasting um, services that I looked at, Vermont in April, um, there's only a 20% chance that you'll be able to see, dramatically see a total eclipse. Um, a much more likely place would have been to go to various parts in Texas of Texas. But I didn't want to jump on a plane um, with with my, ex my extended family. So we decided for Vermont. Um, and we just went for it. We booked our hotel rooms a year in advance and we got there and it was crystal clear and it was raining in many parts of Texas. So we nailed that one. It was um, it was a fabulous experience. People have talked about it. Um, you know, my my buddies who had seen total solar eclipses before had talked about it and I had never seen one. And, you know, it just cemented. Um, as you talked about in the opening, cemented this this love of the moon. I mean, you love the moon. That's a kind of a crazy concept, but but I do. And having that opportunity to see that total eclipse was great. So I encourage you, um, as well as all of the watchers and listeners, that that is certainly something to do if you ever have an opportunity in the future. Yeah, my brother saw it and he took his whole family and uh, I was in the middle of finishing up my, the production of the book. So I couldn't go, but he loved it and they were all sharing. So uh, it is amazing to see how things change. You don't really realize suddenly the moon can take away the sun. <laughs> I know, right? It's, it's and, and, and I kept thinking to myself, imagine if you were seeing that a thousand years ago and you really didn't know what was going, what the deal was, what was going on. And it wasn't predicted. It just randomly happened to be like, Whoa, that freaked us out. What's going on. The world is coming to an end. <laughs> I know it's uh, very interesting. Um, so I would love to tap into your book. And the reason why is it's such a perfect time in July 12th. Uh, this will be aired beforehand is fly me to the moon. The trailer is coming out and I was flabbergasted at the story of it it's about faking the moon landing and <laughs> it's not the only movie that has done that like capricorn one in 1977 did the same yeah. thing and when i was looking back going in the rabbit hole it was there's always been this undercurrent of people thinking it's faking of the moon and then making fun of it in movies and i'd love to get your perspective as you've been much more in the into the weeds into the depths of and seeing some of the astronauts actually met some of them what do you think of all of this? And what do you think about the movie? <laughs> um, well, I haven't seen the movie. I have seen the trailer. Um, I will see the movie when it comes out. I mean, it looks really it looks really interesting. It's a comedy. So they're kind of making fun of the whole thing of um, uh, 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 of faking the moon landing. Whereas, as I, as I recall, it's been a long time since I've seen Capricorn One, but that was, I, I think, was not done as a comedy, done more of a serious movie. You know, whenever something incredible and, and amazing happens, um, you know, people or, or tragic people want to um, figure out whether there's some conspiracy going on and, you know, why did this happen? Is it really a fact and what's happening? And that happened um, with uh, the moon landings very soon after they happened. Um, I remember once um, that I was 
um, having um, dinner with a couple of the astronauts who actually walked on the surface of the moon. And they started to joke about the idea of um, of these conspiracy theorists. Um, this was a while ago. This is probably 10, more than 10 years ago. I bet it was a dozen years ago that I was having this dinner. And they, they just sort of laughed and said, oh, yeah, yeah, we got to go to, you know, ABC Television Studio 2 and, and, and record another moon landing. It hasn't, we haven't had one for 40 years. Um, and it, it just kind of made me laugh that the astronauts themselves are, were joking about, about that whole thing. Um, but I think because it was such an audacious and amazing and ridiculously, um, successful program, the idea that using 1960s technology, we went to the surface, humans went to the surface of the moon and lived there for a few days and walked around and took photographs and videos and slept and ate. And I mean, how unbelievably crazy is that? And so, so, so people naturally think, oh, it didn't really happen. And they, they want to, they want to talk about it. Um, but the vast majority of people recognize that yes, it did. And I remember that same conversation where, um, where the astronauts were joking about faking the moon landings, um, that, um, one of them, and I think it was Gene Cernan, but I may be wrong, but one of the people that I was speaking with about this said, you know, if we had really faked it, the Russians would have known that we faked it. But the Russians were tracking us the whole time. The Russians knew that we uh, were able to orbit the moon on Apollo 8. The Russians knew that we reached the moon with Apollo 10 and we had two spacecraft or orbiting the moon at the same time, uh, the lunar module and the command module with Apollo 10. They knew that Apollo 11 also reached the moon and landed on the moon because they were monitoring what we were doing. They were um, probably equally technologically savvy as we were. They did the first um, human in space, the first woman in space, the first um, extravehicular activity or so-called spacewalk. Um, that was all done by the Russians. So um, they were very technologically savvy and they knew that we made it. If we had faked it, they would have been all over us about it, and they weren't. So um, it did happen. <laughs> it's funny to be to try to defend the fact that we did actually make it to the moon uh, fifty whatever five years later. But yes, we did. But what's fascinating is a lot of people say, then why why haven't we been to the moon? What what is the theory about that? And I think that's where a lot of the suspicion comes in. It's almost like, and this is like a totally off the cuff example, but it's kind of like Kate Middleton hiding and never showing herself, and people are getting more and more suspicious. It's creating that room for conspiracy. And uh, why do you think that they're not really tackling it more? on explaining that why we haven't well one one line of thinking which i've given a lot of thought to is the uh, and my co-author rich jerick in our book marketing the moon have given a, a lot of thought to is the is the idea that from the marketing perspective the um uh leading up to um the apollo program the um entire um way that was t the moon was talked about and reaching the moon was talked about even going back to john f kennedy's speech in the very early 1960s about how you know we will go to the moon and we will go to the moon in this decade um it was sold as a quest it was sold as an adventure it was sold in a similar way that um, Columbus sold the idea of sailing um, to, um, you know, what he called this new world, you know, and the idea was once you reached it, that quest or that was done, that goal was achieved. And unlike Columbus, that uh, you were looking for wealth to bring back to the con the main country. We were going there just to plant a flag. That's sort of what we were sold. Um, and it was a super successful approach, um, which we talk about a ton in Marketing the Moon, but um, there, there was not any follow-up built into it. So, um, you know, they had, yes, we landed first on Apollo 11, 
but there were initially um, a bunch of, of other um, lunar missions planned, but the public kind of got bored with it. Okay, we did that again. What is this? Just a repeat. So Apollo 12 was a repeat. Apollo 13 was a so-called successful failure. They didn't reach the moon and, and were, in, were in dire danger, but we, we brought them home. And then Apollo 14, 15, 16, 17 all did essentially the same thing, although longer missions. And we had the lunar rover starting uh, with Apollo 16. Um, no, sorry, Apollo 15. But um, but but it was still, okay, we made it once. So what are we doing there? I mean, we're not collecting gold and bringing it back. You know, what, what's going on? Um, and so I think that was part of the the reason why um, why people said, well, you know, what what's going on here? And um, the other the other interesting thing re- related to this was President Nixon very quickly eliminated Apollo's eighteen and nineteen. Um, they were supposed to go to the moon. There were supposed to be two more missions, but he just canceled them because, again, because, okay, we did it once. Yay, we won. We beat the Russians. Yes, we landed on the moon. Plant the flag. One of one of humankind's most uh, amazing and audacious things has successfully happened, but we did it again and again and again and again and again. <laughs> um, so had it been sold differently, maybe – there would have been um, more interest in those subsequent missions. Maybe there would have been less conspiracy-minded people who wondered what in the world was going on here. It's interesting because I'm wondering with this move, Fly Me to the Moon, is it going to make the conspiracy theorists have a heyday even more so? And how is NASA handling that? I just think it's fascinating because this is – it's going to create a debate, which I think – Bad news is good news, right? It, it gives highlight to the great work that NASA is doing. What do you think about that? Well, we haven't seen the film yet, or at least I haven't, um, I'm, uh, because it's it's not out as we're recording this. We've only right. been able to see the trailer. But, um, uh, you know, sometimes humor um, is truth. You know, people laugh because something feels right to us for some reason. So it'll be interesting to see what that reaction is. And will um, the people who believe that the moon landings were faked, um, you know, come out of the woodwork again, like they have done several times, like in the 70s with Capricorn One and and during the, the, the missions themselves in the late 60s, early 70s? Who knows? Um, NASA is a great PR and marketing machine. They've done a fabulous job, um, you know, from the beginning, marketing the Apollo programs and marketing subsequent programs. Uh, and today they're, they're great at um, using new tools, video, um, you know, real-time tools. Um, they've got a great following on Instagram, for example. So um, I wonder if they even need to react, you know, when something is mm-hmm. as ridiculous as saying we fake the moon landings come out, I would recommend you don't even need to react to that. I mean, just or make maybe you make fun of it somehow or or somehow newsjack the movie itself. But um, it doesn't seem to me like you have to justify that. Yeah, 55 years ago, we first landed on the moon. It happened. <laughs> um, um, you know, do you need to really, really revisit that? And, and I don't think you do unless it's a matter of sort of making fun of it in some way and then pointing to uh, a, pr- a proof point of some kind. So let me ask you this. If they were going to do the moon for the first time right now, uh, do you think they would be successful at it? Like if they, if Kennedy had said that speech probably 10 years ago from now and we're getting ready mm-hmm. for it uh, with all the social media and all the things that are out there, how do you think – would they've had to play it differently? I mean, when I look in the read in the book, and I'd highly recommend the book is, is a primer for any communications and marketing professional to understand how to make something big real. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, I think it would have been tough to pull off. I mean, yes, we're planning to go back. Um, and there's a pro- active program right now in, in process to do the steps required to get us back to the moon. Um, but I don't know that we've ever been able to have a consensus in this in this country, at least, to do another incredibly audacious project that takes 5% of our, of our national budget and 2% of the people 
the workers in this country. That, and that's what the Apollo program was. 5% of our budget and 2% of the people, um, the workers in the country um, were involved with that program. And so I don't know what else has been, you know, other than perhaps, I don't know, the Vietnam War or the Iraq War. I don't know. But um, I mean, it's certainly not something like let's cure cancer or um, let's solve um, global warming. Th those things don't command the same amount of, of financial resources of the U.S. government and the same resources of, of human ingenuity. They, they ju I mean, they there's some going on, which is good, but it's not at the same level. I think part of it is because of social media, um, um, partisan politics has become um, much stronger because, you know, it used to be, you know, you disagreed, but eventually the country would often come together. But today it's like you've got the blue team, you've got the red team, and it's really, really, really hard to bring those teams together to do anything audacious. So I'm not sure that a, a program of that um, enormity could could be pulled off in this environment unless it were a dire circumstance of some kind. Um, um, yes, we're going back to the moon, but it's not. They're not sp spending nearly the amount of resources that we spent in the nineteen sixties to do the same sort of project. So let me ask you this: Do you think the reason why the moon happened as an underlying passion and reason is because of the assassination of Kennedy. Do you think that, that that in itself propelled people not to be able to say no to the budgets, say no to it, that there was something in all of us wanting to complete and honor President Kennedy? I don't think so. Okay. Um, I, um, I don't think that the honoring a single person, even though he was president of the United States, so single person's vision would be a reason to spend that crazy amount of money to do the project. Mm -hmm. I think, um, number one, it was a proxy war against the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we could fight them or we could we could fight proxy wars, one of them being who's going to get to the to the moon first. Um, they Russians won who was going to get to space first. We won who was going to get to the moon first. So that was part of it. The other part of it is the contractors um, all absolutely wanted to do it because that was a rare piece of good news that they could report to shareholders and employees and, and the public as, at, a, at large because most of those contractors were, all, were focused a huge amount of their resources in the Vietnam War. So imagine you're um, North American Rockwell and you made airplanes that bombed people in in um, in, uh, in in Vietnam. And then also you built um, uh, the 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 um, command module. Uh, so, wow, we're getting people to space. And that's what they would focus on from a PR perspective. Hey, you know, we're leading the moon landing. They're not going to focus on the fact that they build airplanes to kill people. So um, so I think that was an aspect of it. I think the it allowed the government to do the same thing. You know, let's focus on getting on Apollo, Apollo, Apollo. We're going to go to the moon. How cool is that? Kind of a bit of a smoke screen against what was going on in the Vietnam War. Um, those are a couple of things that come to mind um, and also reasons why maybe it would be hard to pull something that, like that off today um, because we'd have to think of what is the next project that's going to put up a smoke screen against some negative things that we're going that are going on today. And, and I don't know. I'd be on my pay grade to sort that out. But those are some things that come to mind for me. That's interesting. Um, that's kind of smoke screen. And I, that's what you were talking about in previous podcasts we've had about the real time effect. It's hard to fool the public as you could do beforehand of creating this kind of a passion for the moon. Um, in yeah, and I'm not, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt. I'm not sure that it was to fool the public because it was a project that, you know, was, was huge for humanity. You know, something like half the people in the world watched that moon landing on television, at least parts, parts of it on television. It was an incredible way for the United States to 
sort of assert its dominance and its and its um, authority and its ability to think huge about things. So it was a very important project in its own right, but there were other underlying things going on that that made it a little more complicated than just what we were saying on the surface. Yeah, no, that's interesting. But if you look, if you look back to the tradition of NASA, they've been so excellent at embedding marketing and PR into everything they do. I mean, starting just with using words of the memo that, that, that President Kennedy got to read and got so ignited and created this vision that we all have been um, exposed to. What do you think are like the three to five things and maybe a takeaways that we can learn from what is it that they do so well and they continue to do well even though they fail at certain times in the meeting when they look really bad they're able to bring themselves up again what do you think that is well first of all um nasa was incredibly secretive in the 50s and early 60s um they were um basically they weren't part of the military, but they acted like they were part of the military. You know, when they when some of the first um, space um, shots were, were sent, the rockets were sent, it, it was being secretive. Media didn't know when it was going to happen. And it was really with the Apollo program where things opened up. And one lesson learned, it's a big one, is you have to recognize that when you become open, and deal with the public in such a way that you're sharing, um, you have to also be open to the fact that there might be a failure. Mm -hmm. And so Apollo, thir Apollo 1, for example, the, the, um, the mission that um, had, a, had the tragic fire that killed three astronauts um, uh, leading, uh, during a test that was leading up to the first launch of the Apollo spacecraft, um, that they reported right away. Um, uh, well, actually, right away after they alerted the, the wives of the three astronauts um, and Apollo 13, they had a live audio of the mission um, available to members of the media. So it was live, you know, and if they died, they would the world would know and know about it live. Um, and so this idea of understanding that you have to um uh, if you're going to be open, and I think most organizations should be open, that it, you're setting yourself up that you're going to also be open if there's a failure. Um, the second lesson that I think is super interesting is the idea of how important content is of all kinds. So NASA um, insisted that uh, cameras and video cameras be brought to the surface of the moon. And that was a huge technological challenge because at the time, video cameras were enormous. You know, they were, they were these huge stationary things on, on, on wheels that sat in, um, in video studios. And there wasn't a, a, a real way that you could take a compact video camera um, when the Apollo program was kicking off in the mid 60s. So they had to spend millions of dollars to figure out how in the world are we going to transmit live video from the Apollo um, missions from the surface of the moon back to the Earth. It was a huge, huge project. And a lot of people um, in, um, in and around NASA said it's not worth the effort. We should be putting more time and effort into other aspects of this program rather than spending all of this time and effort to figure out how we're going to get live pictures from the surface of the moon, live video from the surface of the moon. Um, and so um, and they also said we can't afford the weight. You know, that they're figuring out how much is this video camera system going to weigh? Is it 20 pounds or 30 pounds? How much are the how much of these cameras and all the film Way is it another five or six pounds? And you add, and they added that up and said, I'd rather bring fuel <laughs> than bring all of that camera gear. But um, fortunately, um, they focused on this content because they recognized that at, as a marketing tool, the fact that um, 
that that we humans back on the surface of the moon, I mean, sorry, on the surface of the earth, wanted to see in real time what was going on and wanted to see after the fact in in beautiful photographs what what happened. Um, so oh, having the ability to have that content was was really, really important. The other thing NASA did um, which was super interesting that the Russians really didn't do was to personalize the astronauts, um, you know, in a sense made them into heroes, but personalize them. We, we got glimpses of their families. We got glimpses of the things that they like to do. And sure, it was overly, um, overly insulated. You know, you couldn't see them um, do everything. And there was a, a wink, wink, nod, nod, between members of the press and the astronauts and NASA that, you know, when the guys are out at the bar drinking, you don't cover that. Um, uh, unlike today, if, you know, someone's out drinking, you know, um, it's put it on a, a video on, on your phone and send it to TMZ and it's out in three minutes. But um, that tended to not happen. But the idea that we could humanize the astronauts and, and show what they're what they like to do in their uh, in their personal life was important. And part of that was they had a contract with Life magazine and it was an exclusive contract. And some of the other members of the media said, oh, well, why should Life get an exclusive on this? You know what? We should be able to have access to the astronauts' personal stories as well. And NASA said, look, if it's um, related to space travel, everyone has access to that information at the same time. However, we don't want all of the members of the media bugging the astronauts on their personal time. So we're going to grant an exclusive to Life magazine. Um, and they are the only people who will have access to the astronauts for this exclusive. Um, and they paid paid for that privilege. But I think that was a smart thing to do on NASA's part. Otherwise, there'd be um, there'd be reporters always constantly nagging the astronauts to get personal stories or following their kids to school or following their wives around and so on. And, and that generally didn't happen. So they almost became like a product for the moon for selling. Yeah, them. in a way. Absolutely. They were they were the forward facing part of that program. And they um, they all had PR duty every, um, you know, depending on what mission they were on. They, they called it the, the week in the bubble. They would um, they would occasionally every couple of months or every, you know, once a year or whatever it was, they would um, have the duty of going around and delivering speeches, the astronauts. Um, and that was their their time to do PR. Now, it wasn't when they were leading up to a mission. It might be after a mission was over. But, yeah, part of their job was to become that spokesperson for the space program and for NASA. And that must have been a strain, uh, at least when you're reading about it, the strain of being, and I think that's the strain that we're all feeling right now is we almost have to all be pop products of our services. I think, I think there's some truth to that, you know, and, and yeah, they, they would, they would typically say, Hey, we're trained as engineers. We're trained as test pilots. We're trained as astronauts. We're not trained as PR people. I mean, that's not our job, but, but, it, but NASA was clever in recognizing it was their job and they gave them some training. Um, and some were better at it than others. Some liked it more than others, but, um, but they all had to, you know, do their piece to give speeches and um, go visit um, different places um, on occasion as part of their job. Um, and it was a smart thing to do, to, to, to humanize the people that went to the moon. Otherwise, they were nameless, faceless uh, astronauts. But no, these were these were real people with families. Um, and these were people who um, who had a dangerous job and and the public couldn't get enough of them for the period of time leading up to those missions. Thank you. And I also think what's interesting, and I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I, I think the way they humanize and communicate is not just with the public, but they really know all their stakeholders. Like they're very good at informing the members of Congress. Um, their reports are excellent. They're, they're always at the best of humanizing and making the most dry communication interesting. Yeah, and another aspect that I found really fascinating was the astronauts would frequently go to the different contractors, um, the big contractors like those that are um, 
designing the spacecraft, but they also went to some of the smaller ones, like a small contractor that just built a, a valve for part of one of the rocket engines or the contractor um, that made the spacesuit or the contractor um, that was in charge of um, uh, of fueling the, the spacecraft. I mean, all these, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of these contractors and the astronauts would frequently travel to visit and they would in inevitably when an astronaut showed up, um, they would have a company meeting where the astronaut would say a few words to the members of uh, of the employee base of that company, and that and, and there uh, uh, there were f at the peak four hundred thousand people in this country that were in one way or another working on the Apollo program. So the fact that they did public relations to those people that were working on them, uh, working with them to get to the moon, and, and many of the astronauts, you know, would say, "Hey, we're part of the program. You're an equally important part of the program. Sure, I'm the guy who's going to go in the spacecraft, but you're the people who are making the spacecraft, or you're the people who are making the food that we're going to eat when we're there, or you're the people who are making the wristwatch we will wear to make sure we know what time it is um, when we're on the moon, and these sorts of things." And that. Um, that was a, an important aspect of it was was that approach of, hey, we're all in this together. All, all of humanity is in this together. The American public, we're all in this together because we're paying for it with our tax dollars. And all of you people, 400,000 people involved in this program in one way or another, working full time or part time on the program, you're important as well. That's pretty incredible. Um, how would you say a small company or someone can capitalize, not that you want to bring the whole humanity behind your product, or maybe you do, but how do you, um, how do you ignite that? And like, because you work with a lot of small startups, and so you're at the seed of a vision that's about to be realized. And how do you water and cultivate that so it becomes what you really want it to be? Well, I think, um, as we talked about earlier with NASA, the content piece super important. So the more you can publish and get out there, the better. I also think, um, following up on the what we just talked about, showcasing other people in your organization. You know, many, many startups or, or established companies um, have like the CEO, typically the CEO, but typically one person who's sort of the face of the company. And I'm not suggesting that's that's a bad idea, but we also want to hear from others. You know, in the case of NASA, we want to hear about the person who designed some aspect of the spacecraft. We want to know about the people who are um, literally sewing the spacesuits, you know, and we did learn about those sorts of people. So with, it, with any company, um, it's not just the CEO, it's the engineers, it's the product designers, it's the people who work in the factory. It's, you know, depending on what kind of organization you are, what you do, um, you know, we want to know a little bit about what's going on with some of the people who work there so we can get a, a picture of, of what that company is, is, go is going on. And part of that is, are the people um, within that company that work at that company, are they sharing content? You know, are they active on LinkedIn? Do they have a blog? Do they have a video channel? Are they on Instagram or whatever social network? Um, are they out there creating content as well? And uh, organizations, I think that that number one, allow, but number two, encourage employees to post to create content to share what they're what they're up to is 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 generally a really good thing. You know, the more people who are exposed to um, those in an organization, the better. You know, you go to, you go on a service like LinkedIn, and you type in the name of the company, and if there's 500 people that pop up as employees of that company with active LinkedIn profiles where they're creating content, like writing articles and doing posts and posting videos and so on, that says a lot about a company and it allows us to go in and see what might be going on in that organization if we're thinking about doing business with them. But not that many companies do that. You know, most companies is just one or two people who are out there in the forward facing uh, and, and, and not the rest of the of the employees. It's interesting you say that and we're coming to a close, but it's like Intel Inside. I was so impressed when they did that and they were promoting Aja and a lot of these people that were inventors, but they kind of stopped that. And, and I'm wondering 
Is it because it's too much work to honor everyone in this collective and it's just easier to go with them? Or how, why is it that we know it's a good idea, but we don't do it? Um, there's lots of reasons. I can't comment on Intel, but there's a lot of reasons. There's, you know, in some organizations, there's an attitude that the marketing or the and or the PR department are the ones that are in charge and no one else should be doing anything. In some organizations, it's it's from the top. You know, the, the C-level, especially the CEO says, you know what? I don't want anyone else talking. It's going to muddy up my message. So let's not do it. Um, and then some companies, you know, simply don't understand the idea of how this kind of content can be valuable. And the idea that when people are out there sharing, that can be super cool. They're sharing anyway, but you want them, you want them to be sharing in a public way that people can see. Um, so there's no one reason why um, organizations aren't using this particular strategy, but um, but I think it's an important one because I don't know the actual numbers, but for argument's sake, let's say that the average person on LinkedIn has 300 contacts. I don't know what the real number is. Let's say for argument's sake, it's 300 contacts. And if the, um, if, uh, if a company has a, a thousand employees and everybody's active on LinkedIn, that's an average of 300,000 people exposed. Mm -hmm to what you're do what link what that company is doing just through one social network through LinkedIn and then you multiply that on YouTube and Instagram and podcasts and so on and and it can be a huge multiplier um, of, of of people and I, and I think in some cases the bosses are scared in some cases the bosses um, are reluctant to give up control but in general I like to think you can trust people to do the right thing um, and, you know, just say to them, hey, what I always suggest, say, you're not a spokesperson for the company. You're not speaking on behalf of the company, but but you should be allowed to say, um, hey, here's what I do for my job. It's going great. Um, and, I, and I like what I do here. Wonderful. Is there any company that comes to mind that you think they do really, really well? Uh, my favorite example of that is HubSpot. Um, and I'm biased. I've been on the HubSpot advisory board now for 17 years. Wow. <laughs> I, jo I joined in the second year that HubSpot was um, was around. And, and HubSpot's been um, using a lot of the ideas I talked about, since, talk about since the very beginning. When I joined them, they had $250,000 in revenue. They now have $2.5 billion in annual revenue. So they've done pretty well. Um, but um Thank you. Um, they did all the work. Um, yeah, but they but listened. I, but I have been an advisor for 17 yeah. years. Um, and, and HubSpot, um, you know, people um, create content. They're employees. Doesn't matter what kind of job you have, employees create content. Um, and um, they're very, very active on social networks. They're very, very active in creating blogs and YouTube channels and podcasts and so on. And, and it helps. Um, and they've done great and are still doing great. That's wonderful. So do you have any closing comments to like the movie that's coming out now with the marketing, the moon for our listeners um, to kind of tap into, to learn from that? Was there any? I think, you know, we, we, we talked about marketing the moon. We talked about this idea of content. Um, I think marketing the moon um, and the idea of the Apollo lunar program is one of the most fascinating exa examples of modern marketing that exists which is why I wrote it with my buddy, Rich Jurek, my co-author. That's why we wrote it. And um, it's still a valid example today. It's a, I look at it as the, the, the most amazing case study that exists for, for modern marketing methods. And sure, the, the techniques have changed. You know, in the 1960s, we didn't have social media. We didn't have the Internet. So the techniques have changed. But the strategy and the idea of why this works and how it works has not changed um, and so in many ways, looking at an older example like that is a really good one to get your mind around what's possible today. Yes. Yeah, so I have the book behind me. So go and get your marking to the moon. We'll put that in the links and we'll also have all the links to where you can follow David. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming back and talking about our favorite topic, the moon. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks to be. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keep bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry. 
keep shining and see you next time.